Today, I'll be discussing two films revolving around the concept of mutiny in times of the Soviet Union and its effectiveness on the audience. The first film, Battleship Potemkin, is a 1925 silent Soviet drama film directed by Sergei Eisenstein, who is often considered the founder and pioneer of montage in films. The story is set in 1905 when a mutiny broke out in the Russian battleship Potemkin. As its first film, Sergei gave in representation of mutiny and incorporated aspects of montage to small segments of clips that are condensed to a sequence. The application of music into montage creates a more rhythmic, understandable atmosphere for the audience. The second film that I'll be conducting a comparative study on is The Hunt for the Red October, a 1990 American submarine thriller film directed by John McTiernan. The setting is at the time of the Cold War, November 1984. Soviet communism terrorized the status quo at the time, and propaganda was overflowing in Soviet Russia. Famous books such as 1984 by George Orwell and The Hunt for the Red October, the book that was adapted into the film with the same name, were all prominent works inspired by the Cold War and factors of communism rising to power. These films were chosen both surrounding the convention of mutiny and violence in exchange for freedom. The prominent choices for music and the theory of montage are also present throughout both films. McTiernan displays a realistic spy scenario that shows what really was go ongoing throughout the Cold War. The plot depicts a rogue Soviet submarine captain who tries to defect to America, but by doing so causes confusion that almost leads to a tactical submarine U.S.-Soviet missile war. The movie begins as a submarine captain, Marco Ramius, portrayed by Sean Connery, is assigned to command the Red October, a new kind of strategic sub that is equipped with ballistic missiles and a stealth engine never seen before. This new kind of technology is undetected by its passive sonar, and as the American CIA detects this threat, the Soviet's instruction for Ramius was to for him to launch a nuclear war on the US. Unbeknownst to them, Captain Ramius secretly makes the decision to defect and navigate the crew to America's east coast. On board the Red October, Captain Ramius's defiance and determination for defection swiftly attract the attention of Ivan Putin, a political officer instructed by the Soviet regime to, to watch over the crew. His suspicion of Captain Ramius leads Ramius to secretly murder him. Afterwards, Ramius feeds his crew a lie about conducting drills near America's eastern coast. The concerned CIA submarine USS Dallas detects the Red October with sonar, but utilizing the stealth engine, the Red October rapidly vanishes off the grids. The sequence in which the hunt for Red October is constructed in a way that leads the watcher to realize the tension building up. Between American scenes and the Soviet scenes, we can see the border of language. American characters in the film speak English, while Soviet characters speak Russian. However, this border collapses once Ramius finds Ivan sitting in his cabin. This scene is crucial to the entire plot, as Ivan quotes from a Bible he is holding. He speaks Russian. However, once he reaches the word Armageddon, which means final battle between good and evil as written in the biblical verse, all the Russian characters begin speaking English. The invocation of Christianity links the idea of communism and union. As they dolled on Putin's lips, it seemed that all traces of Russian language were wiped from the rest of the movie. This dilemma of language and elegant transition brings us closer to Russian characters, and this also links us a sense of mutiny. It is like a veil has been cut and the border shattered, as Battleship Potemkin also strongly holds up the employment of mutiny. In Battleship Potemkin, Sergei Eisenstein split the movie into five separate parts. The film begins with part one, Men and Maggots. Sailor, two sailors are discussing the need for crew of Potemkin to support the revolution taking place within Russia on board the vessel Potemkin. We catch a scene of a tall officer wandering into the sailor's bunk, but he unintentionally trips, and enraged, he unleashes his criticism on a sleeping sailor who is apparently out of order. Eisenstein presents the scene and inflicts the audience with, to load the high-ranking high of, officials on board while pitying the poor sailors. Eisenstein's goal is spreading pathos to the audience on the condition the sailors are housed in. This causes Vakulinchuk, the sailor we have seen previously discussing with another about revolution, to speak out to the rest of the sailors. His speech motivates the crew as he blatantly talks about the devastating way they are treated on the ship. The camera performs a wide shot of sailors huddled around their apparent meal, a chunk of meat. As the camera does a close-up on the meat, it is displayed that there are numerous worms crawling on it. 
The ship's doctor is summoned as he inspects the meat. He openly claims that the worms are maggots and it is no huge problem to get rid of. With that, he ends the conversation. The crew, disgusted by their food, chooses snacks and bread to dine on instead. As the act ends with the sailor washing the dishes, the music rhyming with the building tensions loudens as he sees an inscription on the plate. Religion plays a huge role as Eisenstein has metaphorically exhibited that sailors are almost reliant on God's help to deal with the problems of their suppression and poor treatment by the high-ranking officials. It is seen now that both films have incorporations of religion in play. They become substantial as the Orthodox Christianity established an inexorably tight belief in the Soviet Union and is also commonly supported in order to have a sense of unity. It also shows that in both Hunt for the Red October and Battleship Potemkin, that obeying high-ranking officials and following the instruction issued from the Soviet regime is almost inevitable and low-ranking individuals are to be made domesticated in order to fit in the united regime. If anyone were to step out of line, they were to suffer the consequences, as seen in Eisenstein's Act 2. The high-ranking officials, under the order of the captain, were thrown down and to be shot. Thankfully, they were upheaved by the mutiny of the crew's courage to join the revol uh, revolution. In Hunt for the Red October, the Soviet ambassador, played by Joss Aquand, informs the US government that Ramius is a regionad and asks for help in sinking Red October. There was also a spy from the Soviets on board to disrupt any attempts that would disobey orders. Ultimately, both endings and plots are about mutiny, escape, and revolution. McTiernan makes one of the most memorable things about The Hunt for Red October is its score by Basil Pedoris. The Hunt for Red October film marked the composer's collaboration with director McTiernan, whose previous two films, Predator and Die Hard, are often considered the greatest action films ever made. In Hunt for the Red October, Pedoris was able to combine factors of orchestral, choral, and electronic elements into the scenes. His utilization of masculine soundtracks was an immaculate fit for the alpha male world of spycraft and nuclear warfare, as depicted in the film. This transforms the musics in Hunt for Red October into a bold, action-packed orchestral and electronic hybrid score that collaborates with the intensity of the scenario. Most, most memorably, Paul Doris also explored his richly classical side in writing the Hymn to Red October, a bold and lusty Russian language choral piece which any of the old Soviet greats would have been proud to have within their canon. As the plot journeys near the end of Battleship Potemkin, in some of its final acts, the mutiny directed by none other than the rebellious Vakulinchuk comes to a success, but at the cost of his own life. The people of Odessa supports the sailors in overthrowing the tyranny, and they pay tribute to Vakulinchuk's loss, and unites together as one to rally. Eisenstein conveys this to an audience through the use of escalated music to express how energized the people are. One man, probably sent by the government in an attempt to calm the citizens' fury by blatantly shouting out that they should turn their rage instead against the Jews, however, is beaten in the chaos. The disruption and chain reaction of order values so high by government leads the government to dispatch the cavalry and police to oppress their support for the rebel sailors. The various montage shots combined with the accelerating beats of music, making Eisenstein's target to antagonize the brutality of the government transparent as ever. We can see this as the supporter breaks their ranks, the troops proceed to savagely fire or stab at people in their way, regardless if they are women or child. Perhaps the most notable shot was baby carriage rolling down the huge steps with the child's guardian shot dead by the squad. Essentially, Eisenstein sends the clear message that the corrupted government forces should indeed carry out inhumane acts in order to subdue and reinstall order. This is also very similarly shown in the hunt for Red October. As the Red October encounters the CIA vessel USS Dallas, the high-ranking Soviet ambassador witnesses Ramius's plan of defection and in desperation tells the US that the Red October is a Soviet submarine that should be sunken. However, the main protagonist in the US, Jack Ryan, has theorized him to have thoughts on defection leading up to a hypothesis. His c conclusion was correct, and they board the Soviet submarine, allowing Captain Ramius ultimately to reveal his plans for defection on the Red October to Ryan and the crew of the USS Dallas. This action significantly correlates to Battleship Potemkin's showcase of corrupt government's willingness to take hostile action. Indeed, the Soviets soon dispatched their vessel, the Konovalov, to er eradicate the Red October. This really relates to the theme of inhumanity to establish order and raise problems via brute force permanently. The two famous film directors, Eisenstein and McTiernan, both symbolizes traits of rebellion, mutiny, corruption, and suppression, and are made plain as day through the aspects of injustice, unfairness, religion, tone, music, and the plot itself.
The conventional films idealized Russia and the Soviet Union to be unjust, and the plot unfolded is relatively alike. My summarization of this comparison would be the toil and lost rebels are needed to face in order to do what is virtuous.